Welcome everyone, we'll get started in just a minute. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the, today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr and I am Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. Um, we are very, very pleased today to have Sinclair Vincent, Anna Mortimer, and Kristen Lynn Scott from VERA um, to present about VERA's programs on sustainability, resilience, and carbon. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, we'll first have an initial presentation um, by Sinclair, Anna, and Kristen, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, we should have ample time for Q&A. And we encourage you to send your questions in at any time during the presentation, but we'll, we'll hold most of them for the end unless it's a quick clarifying question. Um, so you can send them in either through the question panel of the user interface or in the chat. Now with the chat, you can chat freely. You can send things just to individuals, um, to one of us or to um, everyone, all attendees. We just, and you are encouraged to send relevant content to all attendees. We just ask that you keep it professional for anything going out uh, through the chat. So um, thank you so much, uh, Sinclair, Anna and Kristen. We're, we're so glad you're here with us and I will turn it over to you guys. Great, thank you, Sarah, and we're excited to speak with you all today about some of Vera's programs and how they relate to sustainability, resilience, and carbon, and um, in particular can support um, coastal and marine ecosystems. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, just a little overview of what we'll go over today is a quick introduction of Vera, you know, what, what is Vera um, as an organization, and then we'll talk about our work that's related to blue carbon, um, coastal resi resilience and to plastic waste reduction. Um, so just quick introductions. Um, I'm Sinclair Vincent, our Director of Sustainable Development, Innovation and Markets. Um, I've been at Vera for about seven and a half years now and I'm looking after our um, non-carbon programs, uh, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, and ensuring that we evolve and update those programs over time to respond to market dynamics, you know, changes to monitoring and technology, um, and just ensure that those programs remain fit for purpose. Um, I'm joined today by Anna Mortimer. Uh, Anna is a senior program officer and supports a number of essential functions of Vera's program management team and spends a majority of her time on projects using the sustainable development programs that we'll talk about, um, particularly the CCB standards and SD Vista. Um, Anna also assists the program development and innovation team on uh, our work scaling up blue carbon activities. And then after you hear from Anna, you'll hear from Kristen Linscott, who is a program officer specifically for the plastic program. Um, she supports the development of the plastic waste reduction program and its success as a robust and impactful program, um, providing technical guidance and support to project developers, methodology developers, and validation and verification bodies and the implementation of that program. Um, so just to kind of kick off uh, the presentation here, um, I want to talk a little bit about just who Vera is. Um, Vera is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2007. Uh, we are technically headquartered in Washington, D.C., although one of uh, the main benefits of a global pandemic was that we really opened up our hiring um, internationally. So we now have staff in several other countries. Um, uh, including some of the ones mentioned here on this slide, but uh, many others. Um, and our main activity is to develop and manage standards for a sustainable future. Um, if you've heard of us, it's likely for our flagship program, the Verified Carbon Standard or the VCS, um, which is the world's leading voluntary greenhouse gas program. Um, we have uh, since issued uh, or and retired, I should say, um, more than 460 million verified carbon units under the VCS program. Um, but since we started the VCS program um, back in 2013 or so, we 
diversified to include the climate community and biodiversity standards, which is a multiple benefit certification program for projects specifically in the land use space. Um, we also now operate the Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard, or uh, for short, SD VISTA, um, which is sort of a broadening of the CCB standards for certification of projects um, and their impact on the sustainable development goals in any sector. Um, and then just one year ago, uh, we launched our newest program, which Kristen will talk about a little bit more in a bit. Um, that's the Plastic Waste Reduction Program, which establishes a plastic crediting mechanism to really bring investment to projects anywhere in the world that are increasing plastic waste collection or recycling. Um, and both the CCB and SD VISTA programs can actually be used in conjunction with our greenhouse gas and plastic programs to quantify the other benefits that carbon and plastic projects often have. Um, so with that, I'll let Anna and Kristen get us into a little bit more detail, um, starting with blue carbon. So over to you, Anna. Thanks, Sinclair, for the introduction. So as Sinclair mentioned, we'll be speaking about a few programs today, but I'm gonna focus on three. Before I dive into blue carbon, I wanna first discuss the VCS program. The VCS program allows projects to verify emissions reductions or removals using the VCS standard or the verified carbon standard. This standard sets out rules and requirements that projects must meet in order to verify and issue carbon credits. The verification of a project under the VCS standard results in the generation of a VCU or a verified carbon unit. A VCU represents one ton of CO2 equivalent. Under this program, projects must use an approved methodology to account for carbon emissions and removals, and approved methodologies are methodologies under the VCS program, the CDM, and the Climate Action Reserve, excluding the forestry protocols. Um, in the context of the VCS program, carbon accounting and carbon accounting programs, what is blue carbon? So blue carbon or blue carbon ecosystems are tidal wetlands composed of either mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass, or a combination of the three. Blue carbon ecosystems sequester carbon from existing biomass through photosynthesis, and then that carbon gets deposited into the soil where it is sequestered and stored. I love this graphic. I always like to show it. Um, it shows the global extent of tidal wetlands, which I think is really unique because it shows how extensive but limited blue carbon ecosystems are globally. Um, and when I say limited, I mean they occupy a much smaller land surface, but they have a really big impact, uh, which I will talk about in a moment. There are two types of blue carbon activities, restoration of wetland ecosystems and conservation of uh, which results in emissions reductions and in some case removals. So the restoration activities could look like the following. Removing tidal barriers, improving hydrological connectivity, restoring tidal flow to wetlands or lowering water levels, beneficial use of dredge material or diverting river sediments, restoring tidal flow to tidally restricted areas, reducing nutrient loads leading to improved water clarity to expand seagrass meadows, um, re recovering tidal and other hydrological flushing and exchange, reseeding and replanting, and then removing invasive uh, species and reduced grazing. A successful restoration project would look like increased vegetation in addition to what is being re reseeded and replanted, increased habitat, and therefore my more biodiversity of fauna, lower impacts of erosion and sea level rise, improved water quality, and potentially improved fisheries management. Conservation activities could look like community supported management and agreements, established protected government regulations, improving water management on drained wetlands, maintaining or improving water quality for seagrass meadows, re, uh, creating accommodation space for wetland migration with sea level rise. A successful conservation project can look like natural regeneration of biodiversity due to avoided conversion, reduction in erosion and loss of sediments, improved water quality, preserved habitats for fauna, and the creation of marine protected areas or national parks. So for example, in the US, we have Biscayne, national, uh, Biscayne Bay National Park, which protects and conserves mangroves and tidal ecosystems. And it's actually a park made of 95% water, which is pretty unique. 
Coastal ecosystems such as mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass meadows sequester and store more carbon per unit area than terrestrial forests and are now being recognized for their role in mitigating climate change. 83% of global carbon, the global carbon cycle is circulated through the ocean, but coastal ecosystems account for 2% of the ocean area and sequester 50% of the sediment carbon, which doesn't even account for tidal estuary and wetlands. As you can see, blue carbon activities store far more carbon in the soils than terrestrial forests, even rainforests. Why is this important? Because soils store more carbon than above ground biomass, and therefore soil has a much greater potential for long-term carbon sequestration and storage. Unfortunately, globally, coastal and tidal wetland ecosystems are under serious threat from agriculture, logging, and unsustainable tourism infrastructure. If we were to think about developing a blue carbon project, it's important to understand the value of blue carbon. So the estimated value represented here is US dollars uh, is based on the global distribution of these ecosystems, the carbon stocks and the potential for restoration and conservation activities. As you can see, mangroves have the highest value because they have the highest carbon stocks and have a high potential for conservation and restoration activities. We're seeing many more mangroves projects uh, for a number of reasons. Um, they you know, have the highest value as one. They result in potentially more VCUs. Um, they also can take less time to result in VCUs because the sequestration potential is higher. Um, and we also have a conservation methodology which uh, did not exist previously. So that is driving a lot of uh, mangroves projects at this time. However, the other ecosystem types are just as important and unfortunately, we see restoration and, and uh, restoration happening at a much lower level globally, even though the other blue carbon ecosystems are still uh, still store more organic carbon than terrestrial forests. So how do we account for carbon stored within the soil and within above ground biomass in a blue carbon project? In restoration activities, carbon is uh, accounted through sequestration in biomass and soil through the restoration activities, which leads to reduced emissions from soils. So we think of this as where wetlands either didn't exist or were severely degraded and where there is no sequestration or low sequestration potential. Through project activities, the wetlands are now able to sequester carbon in above ground and below ground carbon sinks. In conservation activities, we calculate the carbon sequestration between expected wetland degradation and or conversion in the baseline, so the existing condition, and the actual conversion within the project scenario. Similar to ter terrestrial conservation activities, we think of this as the difference between what the existing conditions are and will be due to future degradation, and then compare it to what the, pro the potential would be after project interventions. As I mentioned before, under the VCS program, projects must use an approved methodology to account for carbon removals and reductions. There are only three methodologies under the VCS program that support blue carbon activities. Additionally, there are less than 25 blue carbon projects under the VCS program, including registered and listed. VM33 accounts for tidal wetland restoration activities, as you can see, uh, by the title, such as replanting, reseeding, altering the sediment supply, and other activities I mentioned before. VM7 includes both conservation and restoration activities, allowing projects to use the methodology for either one or both uh, of these activity types. Just to reiterate, this is the first blue carbon conservation methodology, which is really exciting. And you know, as soon as we had this methodology uh, approved, we did start to see projects come in, and I will talk about one of those projects in a minute. Um, the reason why I only touched on VM33 and VM7 is because these methodologies are the methodologies in use. We actually don't have any projects using VM24. One example of a restoration project is the Virginia Seagrass Project. Uh, this project focuses on eelgrass restoration on the eastern shore of Virginia. Um, through replanting and reseeding activities, the project will increase the cover of eelgrass along the coastline. Uh, this is one of three projects using VM33 and will be the first seagrass restoration project listed on the pipeline. 
Um, to know this project is a, in a potentially common situation where the government has legal rights to all subaquatic bottomlands, which is where these activities take place. And therefore there will need to be cooperation between the state and other entities to implement this project. So this is, can be common for projects and potentially could be very common for other blue carbon projects. Um, this project is still under development and the Nature Conservancy is working on this project. Um, it's not yet listed on the pipeline. This project does have some additional benefits, which would be improved nearshore water quality and reduced impacts from flooding. One example of a conservation project and the first conservation project um, is the Blue Carbon Project Gulf of Morisquillo or the Vita Mangalar project. Um, this is the first mangroves conservation project, as I mentioned, it's really exciting. So I wanna say it again. Um, and this is because previously there were only restoration activities that were possible under VM33 or VM24, which existed under the VCS program. And there's only one restor and there's only restoration methodologies under the CDM. The project activities include alternative livelihood acti activities such as beekeeping to prevent further degradation due to agriculture. The project relies on communities and fishermen to monitor mangrove habitats for sighting of manatees and other uh, fauna. The project includes uh, activities to improve existing agricultural practices to avoid future de deforestation and degradation. These activities will and have resulted in the conservation of intact wetlands, as these activities work to reduce the threat of unplanned degradation and deforestation. I think this is a great example of a project that combines community engagement with biodiversity preservation in both the protection of mangroves, but also the protection and monitoring of regional fauna, such as manatees and fish. So gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about coastal resilience, which is an additional benefit to blue carbon projects. As I mentioned on a previous slide and of talking about these two projects, there are a number of non-carbon benefits to tidal wetlands projects. Um, these non-carbon benefits, such as habitat protection and restoration, improved water quality, climate change um, adaptation, mitigation of sea level rise, uh, these benefits go beyond accounting to preserve and maintain coastal habitats and ecosystems, as well as preserving livelihoods for coastal communities and protecting against storm damage and sea level rise. Um, this includes, you know, climate change adaptation, which as a result uh, of climate change, we're going to see stronger and more frequent storm events, as well as sea level rise. One of the most observable and arguably important non-carbon benefit is reduced impact from flooding. We assess the reduced impact by first understanding what the flooding impacts due to storm events would be without project intervention. To do this, we need to assess the movement of offshore and nearshore waves and assess the historical storm damage that has occurred within the region. Then, through modeling, we can extrapolate what potential impacts due to storm events would be, including the impacts of climate change on future weather conditions. Through this analysis, we can also understand the impacts of sea level rise on coastal communities and therefore understand what project intervention activities can protect people and property from both impacts of sea level rise and storm related flooding. So Sinclair touched upon these standards before. Um, but there are two other standards that provide pathways to verification of these additional benefits, such as coastal resilience. Um, and often the activities verified under these additional standards dovetail with project activities, as projects often and typically include, include communities in implementing conservation or restoration activities, as well as biodiversity monitoring. So the CCB program allows for the verification of activities targeted towards community engagement and biodiversity preservation in addition to climate benefits. CCB projects are often tied to VCS, they're often combined with the VCS project. Um, therefore, they do have to use an approved methodology for the uh, climate portion of the project, so for climate accounting. Um, many, if not most of our land use projects under the VCS program are, do use a CCB program to demonstrate these additional benefits of project activities. Um, 
just want to touch on another project using C CCB, which is located in the Indus Delta region of Pakistan, which engages communities by providing jobs to plant mangroves preserve and preserve lo local cultural landmarks. The project also includes microfinance opportunities and educational opportunities for local communities. So by restoring the habitats, the project provides migrational sanctuaries for a number of bird species. Verification under the CCB program, in addition to the VCS program, results in a label on a VCU. So essentially, it's a tag on a VCU that shows this project has certification and verification under the CCB program. The SD VISTA program, as Sinclair mentioned, provides a pathway for verification of project contributions to the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which means projects can include a wide range of activities similar to the CCB program, but can account for them separately. Uh, the SD VISTA program is still growing in use. It's very exciting. We're starting to see a lot of projects and it provides multiple pathways for verification. The SD VISTA program can be used standalone, although today we're speaking about additional benefits to VCS projects. Um, the SD VISTA program also allows for the verification of claims of a contribution to an SDG, which also results in a label. So it also results in that tag. Um, also, the SD VISTA program allows for the generation of an asset, which is similar to a VCU or verified carbon unit, but the asset itself is tied to an SDG. Examples of uh, verified SD VISTA activities include the provision of medical infrastructure, microfinance, and education, all of which can be verified under the CCB program, but under the SD VISTA program, they can be accounted for separately as each of these activities can be tied to a different SDG indicator. In a blue carbon project, for example, coastal resilience, improved fishery management, and improved water quality could all be represented by one SDG, such as life below water, but they could also be represented by multiple SDGs. So the coastal resilience methodology is being developed under the SD VISTA program by the Nature Conservancy. This would allow a blue carbon project to demonstrate the benefit of coastal resilience in protecting people and property from flood damage caused by storm events. This methodology is in the final stage of review. It's really exciting. We're looking forward to this methodology coming out. Um, this methodology will result in an asset, which is a tradable unit separate from a VCU. The metric for this unit is based on both a reduction in people impacted by flood risk and property with annual reduction of flood risk. Um, this methodology can only be used by projects that restore wetlands and conserve intact wetlands through activities that you know, I described earlier in the presentation. The methodology uses modeling similar to the modeling in a VCS project to predict the reduction in risk from flooding in mangrove and salt marsh uh, conservation and restoration activities. This methodology would allow a blue carbon project under both the VCS and the SD VISTA program uh, to generate a VCU and an SD VISTA asset. All right, that's it from me. Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Thanks, Anna. Um, that was so interesting. It's always great to hear what you all are doing. Again, though, I'm Kristen Linscott. I work as a program officer on Vera's plastic program, which is the final Vera program we wanted to discuss with you today. I'm sure you're all well aware of the harmful effects of plastic pollution and its impact on marine and coastal environments. And this program is really all about directing finance to those collection and recycling activities that help to collect or divert plastic from ending up in our oceans. To begin, I wanted to discuss how the plastic standard and the resulting plastic program came to be. So Vera was a founding member of the 3R initiative, which convened a multi-stakeholder group of, um, with the objective of scaling up reduction, recycling, and recovery activities of plastic waste. So stakeholders like Nestle, Tetra Pak, Danone, Conservation International, and South Pole, among others, all provided inputs to support the development of the, of the plastic standard. 
Under this initiative, the plastic standard and its program documents were piloted by 24 projects across the world. This process really helped us to ensure that the standard, which was launched last February, could be applied and used by a variety of project proponents working across the world to increase plastic waste collection and recycling. Projects that register with the program are able to monitor their activities and then issue waste collection credits or waste recycling credits that they can then sell to buyers. So as I mentioned, the plastic standard was designed to be broadly applicable to a variety of waste collection and, and recycling projects anywhere in the world. When we talk about the material types and kind of plastic types encompassed within the project, of the program, um, we include all seven types of plastic, as well as composite materials, which are those multi-layered materials that include um, plastic, maybe foil or other paper, kind of in one um, packaging or, 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 or what have it. And when we talk about the scope of the activities included within the plastic program, it broadly encompasses all plastic waste collection and recycling activities. The specific activity is likely going to differ based on the project um, context. And obviously all collection or recycling activities are gonna have some kind of impact on preventing ocean plastic pollution, but projects may also involve interventions that directly remove plastic from marine or coastal environments. So these could be activities like the recovery of ocean plastics, beach cleanups, or potentially investment in technologies that allow for the recycling of ocean plastic. Regardless of the activity type, all projects though need to be able to show that they're contributing to additional plastic waste collection or recycling that wouldn't have occurred without the project's implementation. A project's compatibility or eligibility with the program will be dictated by whether or not they can meet the rules or re and requirements of two key sets of documents. So the plastic standard, establishes the overarching requirements that all projects seeking registration under the plastic program must meet. This includes the requirements for things like stakeholder consultations that must be held, the social and environmental safeguards that must be in place, and also just the rules around project configuration, um, project start date, crediting period, uh, things like that, that are going to apply to any project that is interested in registering with the program. Now, a project must also then be able to apply one of our approved methodologies, and these include the plastic waste collection methodology, as well as the plastic waste recycling methodology. Which methodology a project chooses to apply will depend on their activity type, but I would like to point out that a project could potentially include both collection and recycling activities, and in this case, they would apply both methodologies. The methodology really gets into the technical requirements that are specific to the activity itself. So it includes the applicability conditions, which you can think of as a key set of eligibility criteria, along with details on how a project should establish the baseline scenario and demonstrate additionality. Plus the methodology gets into outlining how a project should quantify and then monitor their activities over time so that the plastic credits can later be issued. To register and issue credits with the program, projects will document the details of their project design and implementation, and then a third party auditor will come and assess their conformity with the program requirements prior, that, prior to them registering or requesting um, verification approval. I know this is, you know, it's kind of hard to talk about these larger things without some examples. So we did think it'd be helpful to speak of some of the projects that have either begun or completed registration with Vera. So the Second Life project, which is based in Thailand, will be the first project to register and issue credits under the plastic program. Their project is really dynamic in the sense that it covers a wide range of activities, but it has concentrated a lot of its efforts on collecting plastic from hard to reach islands, um, recycling fishing nets and organizing beach cleanups with local organizations. And obviously, as the name suggests, this program um, is based in Thailand right now. And then many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Parlay and the work they do to collect and recycle ocean plastics. 
Uh, earlier this year, they initiated the process of registering their project with Vera by listing on our Vera registry. So now they'll undergo a validation and verification or audit, as you say, um, of their activities, which are located in the Dominican Republic and the Maldives. Um, and they will be able to eventually register and issue credits for their activities. Um, these activities are those that are facilitated by the Parlay Global Cleanup ne Network, where they work with local groups to collect plastic from remote islands, shorelines, and waters. If you do know a project or an organization that may want to register their activities with the plastic program, we would recommend they look at our quick guide for developing a project. This document is a great first resource, first resource for those stakeholders that are interested in getting a high level and understanding of the process um, for registering and overview of the program um, and, and kind of how that would work for them. Now, we just spoke about how a project may register with the plastic program, but to wrap up, I wanted to take a moment to speak about how these credits are actually used once they're purchased. We anticipate that the main buyer of plastic credits are gonna be those companies that have a plastic footprint. So this is either because they directly produce plastic, they use plastic in their operations, or package their products in plastic. In addition to the plastic standard, the 3R initiative also developed the guidelines for corporate plastic stewardship, which are um, shown here on the right. And these address how a company should measure their plastic footprint, take actions to address their footprint within their supply chain, and then ultimately use plastic credits to address the plastic waste that they can't yet eliminate within their supply chain. So specifically, these guidelines highlight that credits should only be used to make the beyond value chain investments after a company has taken actions within their value chain to reduce and reuse plastic or increase the recyclability of the plastic. At Vera, we avoid using the term plastic neutral and instead refer companies to commit to the commitments outlined in the guidelines. So claims like net zero plastic leakage, net 100% recycled at end of life, or net circular plastic can be made to reflect how plastic credits fit into um, a company's broader plastic stewardship strategy. I know that was very high level, but that concludes what we wanted to discuss about the plastic program and plastic credits in the plastic credits that can be issued under it. So now I think I will pass it back to Sarah to lead us through some of the question and answer that we, or questions that we've gotten so far. Okay, um, thank you guys. I have to say we have more really good questions, I think at this point in the webinar that we've ever had before. So uh, we've got lots of good stuff to discuss. Um, Okay, getting started, we'll start with one of the earlier questions. Um, would kelp forests also count for a crucial pool of CO2? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so ocean seeding is like a, is called a sustainable seascape management activity that we've heard a lot of interest in, in and we are currently exploring through our work with the Seascape Carbon Initiative. Um, we have heard that it could be a promising activity, but our understanding is that there's likely additional research needed before uh, the scientific understanding of carbon benefits and other impacts of this type of activity is at a level that could support a GHG methodology. Okay, and I think that sort of gets at, uh, there was this, another question about, uh, are you aware of any kelp projects for carbon sequestration? Yes, um, yes it definitely does, yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, there was a question, does Vera consider the vulnerability of carbon sequestration in the development of blue carbon projects? For example, how vulnerable is seagrass restoration to rising sea level given landward constraints on suitable habitat? Yeah, so all blue carbon projects are potentially vulnerable uh, and take expected sea level rise impacts into account in the project design. Um, it's a key component of project design and methodologies actually provide accounting um, methods for this. Okay, and then is Vera planning to expand methodologies to include other blue carbon habitats such as offshore sediments? 
Yeah, so I touched briefly on this before, um, but we are exploring the potential uh, how to support sustainable seascape management activities in marine and ocean ecosystems uh, through our involvement in the Seascape Carbon Initiative. So one of the types of activities that we are likely to cover through this work is seaweed farms or seaweed aquaculture. Um, we would encourage anyone who's interested in these types of activities to reach out to Vera directly. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question, can we please get an update on the Seascape in initiative? Uh, yes, that is a good question. Um, we are still in the initial development phase with uh, our current partners, um, and we're still working to uh, determine how to best engage with communities, uh, a community of practice, which would include stakeholders, um, both within the Seascape Carbon Initiative, and then also um, trying to see how we can incorporate other um, other organizations that have interest. So again, if you do have interest in, you know, seaweed related activities or, or seascape uh, conservation activities and seascape management, uh, please do reach out to us directly. You might be muted, Sarah. Oh, I am. Yes, thank you. Okay, so moving to plastic, um, is it on Vera's roadmap to include plastic upstream projects in the certification? Uh, for example, avoiding plastic consumption at source instead of only looking at waste management, waste removal, and recycling? I think this is a great question and certainly something that's on our radar. Um, as we mentioned, the program was only launched last year. So starting out, we are kind of focused on the collection and recycling activities, but we certainly plan to explore how activities related to the avoided production or reduction of plastic um, might be, you know, how the scope of our program might be expanded to include those. So I would say maybe stay tuned. Um, and if there are any, you know, specific examples or topics, that's something you're always welcome to email our team as, you know, we look into researching and kind of exploring how this may look. It's always helpful to have specific ideas of, of activities that are happening that might need um, and benefit from a financing option like plastic credits. Okay, thank you. Um, is it recommended that waste collection entities partner partner with waste recycling entities? So we wouldn't recommend one way or the other. Um, I think certainly there are cases where it would make sense for them to partner if it's very integrated. Um, under the recycling methodology, they, we actually would credit activities that maybe increase the collection or sorting of plastic so that more can be recycled. Um, those types of activities could potentially be eligible for recycling credits. So in that case, I think that's a perfect example of where a collector and a recycler might work together on a project where, you know, the collector is helping collect more plastic, and then the recycler is actually doing the recycling. And so together, they could register a project um, to then issue credits for their activities. But we kind of see a variety. We see some projects that are exclusively collection activities. We see others that are focused on the recycling activities themselves. And then we do see those projects, like I said, which are kind of touching at both and a little bit more integrated. And in those cases, they're actually able to, you know, register both of their collection, both their collection and their recycling activities and potentially issue waste collection credits and waste recycling credits for what they're doing. Since those credits represent different types of activities. Um, they could, you know, get a credit for the collection of the plastic waste as well as the recycling of it. Okay, thank you. Um, are there some upcoming plastic programs in Asia? I would like to understand who is running the Thailand project. Are grassroots groups involving, are, are they partnering with companies? Great question. Um, as far as the you know countries, I think we we recognize Southeast Asia is certainly a region where um, 
they could benefit their waste management infrastructure could really benefit from some of these projects that are registering under the plastic program. One key piece of any of Vera's projects, whether it be plastic or the VCS program or CCB SD Vista, is our Vera registry. So I would always refer people to the registry, which shows a listing of all the projects that are either in the um, pipeline phase of registering or have fully registered. And when you look on that registry, you can actually see kind of more information about the project activities occurring, as well as the project proponents. So um, Second Life Thailand, you could go on and click in what we refer to as their project record and open up their project description to see what they're doing on the ground. And that also provides kind of that contact information that might be helpful for um, any you know, external stakeholder who's interested. And to answer the last question about kind of grassroots organizations and their partnership with companies, I think it really varies. We see uh, one of the great parts of this program is how flexible it is and the way it can be applied to a lot of different scenarios. Um, so sometimes credits are formalizing what a grassroots organization is doing so that then maybe a corporate could buy it. But I think um, there may also be instances where a corporate might partner with a, um, an organization and then they could use the various plastic standard to register their activities and be able to monitor and verify them in a very standard standardized way. Um, so we, you know, we have a decent amount of projects listed on that registry that I think offer good examples, um, but we'll see even more added in the next few months. And it should be super interesting to see the diversity of the types of projects and the way projects are applying the plastic standard. Okay, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, let's see. A question, how do you move from successful VCS certification to generating sustainable finance? So I can probably take this one. Um, I think this is fairly standard across all of, I, all of our programs. So VCS, CCBS, DVISTA, and the plastic program. Um, oftentimes you may see projects actually receive early financing or upfront investment in order to get the certification process underway. Um, that often looks like you know, a corporate buyer that is looking to invest in, in the project activities and the outcomes and benefits that they will generate will put up money um, kind of upfront um, with the understanding that the project will go through the certification process and then have those credits to be able to back that investment and show that you know, rigorous accounting and monitoring took place as well as the certification. Um, where projects are able to access uh, or get their project underway and their um, project documentation underway without that upfront investment, they'll go ahead and do so. And then once they have that certification, they then have the credits that show that their project activity was indeed implemented. The benefits that they claim to generate were um, generated and have all been third party audited in a rigorous um, transparent way. And then that's when the finance starts to flow through the purchase of those credits um, that represent, you know, one ton of CO2 equivalent um, or carbon avoided um, or um, removed, or in the case of plastics, you know, one ton of plastic collected or recycled that wouldn't have been otherwise. So the, the finance is meant to flow by way of having these credits represent real positive outcomes of these projects and, and that uh, investors can really um, be sure that their investment is actually generating those outcomes. Okay, thank you, Sinclair. Um, another question, can you touch briefly on an estimated timeline that it takes to go from new standard program idea through methodology development, piloting, and then launching? How do you decide what standards to develop? Um, a very good question. I can talk about kind of the timeline that we had under the plastic waste reduction program, which is our newest one. Um, so probably from the time we, you know, thought about this concept or folks brought it to us and we really vetted it and decided, um, you know, a framework like the ones we create at Vera is a good fit um, to launch of the program last year was probably three to four years, but I would say, um, the development process in earnest was closer to a two year process. Um, so once we identified the concept and that it was fit for you know, our expertise 
and really kicking that development process off. It took about two years and that included, you know, convening a multi-stakeholder group to help us figure out how exactly does a standard for plastic crediting work compared to something um, about carbon or sustainable development outcomes. Um, what are the different technical aspects that would need to be modified for the plastic case? Um, and wanting to make sure that it works both from the corporate or buyer perspective, as well as the implementation and project perspective. Um, this two year process also included the development of the two main methodologies that are used under that program, the plastic program, uh, which is a bit different than some of our other programs that have a lot more methodologies because there are many different activity types that could occur uh, under a greenhouse gas program, for example. Um, the two year process in this case also included 24 pilots. Um, at sort of varying levels of intensity that we use to sort of check and uh, ensure the workability of the standard and of parts of the methodologies themselves. And then, and then we finally launched it at that two year mark. Um, and then just on the second part of the question, you know, how do you decide what standards to develop? Um, we do a good amount of vetting by just speaking with different stakeholders through, you know, across the, the value chain or the different components of, um, you know, the supply and demand side of these projects and really try to understand, you know, what is the demand case for new standards or new methodologies? Who is looking to invest in those activities? Because without that um, investment there waiting, uh, these projects can, often cannot get off the ground. And so we wanna make sure that there really is demand there before we go through um, the intensive, you know, broad stakeholder uh, engagement development process. Okay, thank you, Sinclair. Um, and a lot of those were in the, the Q&A, so we'll move over to some of the questions from the chat. Um, what support is available for small scale projects? I've heard that the verification process can be prohibitively expensive for projects based on small areas. Yeah, maybe Anna or Kristen, you can talk about this with our existing programs. Kristen, why don't you go first? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think this is something that was top of mind for us when it came to developing the plastic standard because we understand that there's the kind of range of activities, there are a lot of small scale projects that could benefit from this, but might not have the maybe capacity or resources. So um, I think we have tried to um, structure the program in a way that that would like the size would not, you know, be a pro, pro would not prohibit a project from registering with the program. But there is kind of an inherent assessment that all projects need to do to weigh the costs of registering with the program versus the amount of credits that they could generate. So in the case of the plastic program, one credit represents one metric ton of plastic, which is a lot of plastic that's either been collected or recycled. And um, it's very impactful, but that one ton is only going to represent one credit and you know, one credit sale. So if a project is only recycling one ton of plastic a year, the kind of efforts to register their project, prepare the project documentation, have that audited, it might not make sense for um, a project of that scale. So that's something that um, if projects are interested, we're always happy to help point them into the direction of maybe some key things they should consider in deciding if it makes sense to pursue certification with one of our programs. Um, but we've certainly tried to keep those projects in mind. Um, specifically, when it comes to our fees, we've tried to scale them so that um, projects kind of of a smaller size, the issuance levy is slightly smaller. So something we're considering, but also, you know, I think we just, the disclaimer that this, all of our programs are very robust and will require some robust documentation that will take time investment um, that just has to be weighed with kind of the output of any project. And Anna, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Yes, sorry, I was having trouble with my unmute. Um, so under the VCS program, um, projects have the uh, potential to be grouped. So we often see that's how projects can scale up from starting from a relatively small uh, area and then potentially expanding. So actually the uh, Cispata project, the Vita Mangalar project, which I spoke briefly about is a grouped project. So the idea is that they've started with a much smaller area and will continue to expand. Um, this can allow a project to 
increase carbon finance, but really get off the ground. Um, and so they have the opportunity to continue to produce uh, higher revenues of carbon credits. Um, additionally, we are considering other changes and innovations to better support these projects, both in blue carbon methodologies, um, so in some cases streamlining, and then in our rules. Um, there is a balance between flexibility and rigor in our standard, and we are trying to maintain, always maintain the highest quality of credits, but we are also trying to see if there are ways to support these smaller activities. Uh, as we know, you know, a lot of blue carbon projects are on relatively small areas. Um, we have also uh, extended a val the validation deadline for small scale projects, which is a recent update under the BCS program. Okay, thank you so much, Anna and Kristen. Um, there are so many good questions. It's really uh, challenging to decide which one we'll go to next. Um, a question, does Vera take a percent of the value of the credits? In other words, how do you finance your operations? Sure, I can take this one. Um, yes, uh, essentially each of our programs has a fee schedule associated with it. Um, and so I think Kristen mentioned it earlier, uh, there's usually a levy um, attached to each credit that we issue under our various programs. And the amount of, of the levy is different in the different programs, um, as well as um, it's sort of a sliding scale depending on the volume of credits you're issuing at one issuance event. Um, so it's a, a small percentage of the uh, value that you typically get for the selling one credits, whether it's carbon or, or plastic. Um, and all of those funds go towards our main maintenance of the program, which includes, you know, the reviews that we have to do of projects, answering stakeholder questions about our rules and requirements, as well as continuing to evolve those programs to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that they remain fit for purpose. Okay, thank you, Sinclair. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a question, are the linkages between mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs considered in computing the amount of net carbon sequestered in a mangrove or seagrass restoration project? For example, some coral reefs could generate net positive amounts of CO2 if they grow rapidly in response to a mangrove restoration project that results in higher water clarity and or lower nutrient loading to the reef. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, at this time, we would consider the benefit to coral reefs as an additional benefit, as I mentioned. Um, you could potentially use the SD Vista program to certify that benefit. Um, but projects can use multiple, can have projects that have multiple ecosystems. So if it exists that a mangroves, you know, project also is tied to a seagrass ecosystem or a salt marsh ecosystem, um, we do allow that under our methodologies and under our programs. So the potential for multiple ecosystems is there, but in terms of um, impacts on coral reefs and coral reef impacts on blue carbon projects, we would consider that an additional benefit. Um, and again, SD Vista uh, program could be really beneficial to help drive finance towards those kinds of projects. Okay, thank you. Um, and what is the typical timeline for a project to go through your certification process? How many years of monitoring is required post-project? Want me to take this? Okay. Um, so it, it is a little bit different uh, depending on the program, but I'll speak to, let's say, a VCS uh, project that has a, an additional certification, so whether it be the SD Vista project uh, program or the CCB program. Um, so in terms of initial development, that really depends on um, the project developer and how long it takes for projects to get off the ground and to implement monitoring activities and you know, really get the project running. Um, we do have two types or, or two validation deadlines, which means projects have to complete validation within a certain period of time. So for small scale activities, uh, this has been recently extended, which I, I think mentioned in the chat or just briefly a minute ago. Um, but then all other activity types have a, a different deadline and I you know, would be happy to, to link the sections in the standard um, where, where, that, where it lists the actual deadlines. Um, so in order to actually go through the VCS process, the first step would be to open an account under the registry and then uh, list on the pipeline. Um, Currently, projects, uh, in order to uh, list on the pipeline, there's an update to our rule where you would need to be under validation, which goes in effect in July. 
Um, so there are two pathways at this point uh, for starting the public comment period. So all projects are required to undergo a 30 day public comment period. Um, so this would be built in uh, our review timeline. So when you request listing, we would have 20 business days to review this request and then it would be uh, hopefully approved and posted on the pipeline, but there could be some back and forth. Um, Typically, we see projects complete uh, validation within one year or so of um, listing on the pipeline. This also depends on how long it takes for validation to occur. Um, so for, and I'm pretty sure this is the correct estimation, I think we see between three and six months for, our, for land use projects, just depending on how complex the project is, um, how you know, hard it may be to get to the project site, so a lot of that depends on the auditor that you work with. Um, so under the VCS program, you are required to have your project audited by a third party. And we have accredited and approved um, bodies under our program, which you can find on the website. Um, so after validation, you could do verification separately, or you could do it at the same time. Projects typically come to us already with monitored data. There is no required amount of monitored data that you need to have uh, when you come to register or verify. But if you are within that, that validation deadline, you'll typically have that many years of verified data. Um, so this cycle then continues. So if you do registration and verification at the same time, and let's say you have two years of monitored data, um, and then you were to choose this verification cycle of every two to three years, you're gonna take the data you have uh, contract with an auditor, they would then verify the existing monitored data. And then at that point, we would issue you a VCU after it's been approved. Um, so, you know, let's say you don't do it at the same time. It could take five years, it could take six years, but typically we see that from project start to um, registration is around five or so years. Um, however, Vera's internal processes, we do have review timelines. So Vera, uh, has 20 business days for initial review. Um, let's say during that review, we identify things that we think our auditor maybe didn't touch upon correctly, or we wanna make sure we're clarifying everything correctly. Um, we would then you know, potentially go back and forth with the project. So uh, it could take between one and three months for a project to officially register. But after that, it's up to the project to determine um, the verification cycle. And again, it could take that one to three to three months to actually have a verification approved, depending on the project. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. Um, we only have time for a few more, so I'll uh, select carefully. Um, there's a question, generally plastics lose quality throughout the recycling process. So would the plastic offset credit be one-to-one -one, or does the methodology account for plastic degradation throughout the recycling process? Good question. Um, the, the methodology, the recycling methodology requires the projects to measure on the output. So it would be just based on the flake or the pellet output output that comes out of the recycling process. Um, so that is not, I guess, maybe the degradation potential isn't explicitly included, but another requirement is that the plastic should be able to displace virgin plastic. So if it's of a quality that can displace virgin plastic, then it wouldn't be considered an eligible recycling activity. I believe you're on mute. Uh, again. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, we had a question. How does blue carbon compare to carbon capture storage in terms of carbon sequestration potential? Since carbon capture storage creates additional wastage and does not improve biodiversity, would it not make more sense for businesses to invest in blue carbon instead of carbon capture storage? Any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm actually not sure about the potential comparison between um, CCS activities and blue carbon activities. Um, and I think that, you know, it's really up to the company and their goals with offsetting and whether those goals include anything related to the benefits to biodiversity or natural ecosystems. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Um, and another question that came in, um, got one more. Who do you see as the types of buyers for the blue carbon and SD Vista credits and how do proponents typically find these buyers? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in terms of the coastal resilience methodology that I touched upon now, we think um, interested buyers could potentially be uh, invest, um, sorry, insurance agencies, um, since a lot of it is, is tied to project uh, property and people impacts. So we think that insurance agencies could very, could very well be interested. Um, in terms of blue carbon credits, it's the same with other types of VCUs. We see a lot of different interests from different groups, but we also know that uh, industries like the shipping industry uh, potentially could have higher uh, interest because, you know, thinking about shipping in terms of, um, you know, boats, for example, you know, they do impact these these coastal ecosystems. So that's a potential interested buyer. Um, but in general, you know, we, we see com companies who want to impact these ecosystems, and it really depends on how their sustainability goals or, or their uh, CSR goals, you know, are set. So, so it's kind of all over the map. Um, in terms of connecting with buyers, Bear actually does not take part in the buying and selling of VCUs. So we're not, you know, necessarily the best resource to come to us and say, how do we find a buyer? Um, but there are retailers and brokers that would be a good place to start. And uh, off the top of my head, the ecosystem marketplace uh, puts out an environmental finance report every year. Um, which actually includes information about potential brokers and retailers and they, you know, they give ratings and, and all of that. So I would recommend going, going that route to find information about how to reach out to a, a broker or a retailer. Okay. Thank you guys. We still had so many great questions, so I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but this was amazing. Thank you so much for presenting on this research and, and this work. Um, uh this was was fabulous and we'd love to have you on again before too long so we can uh uh catch up on any updates and and uh get to some of the questions we weren't able to get to today although you guys also did an amazing job answering people individually so we really appreciate that um so thank you sinclair anna and Kristen. um this is wonderful. And I'd give a quick shout out to Patrick Christ, who is now at Vera and helped connect us to um, these three um, to, for this webinar. Uh, Patrick uh, was PI for the EBM Tools Network, from which the, our, uh, the EBM help and MPA help listservs uh, uh, evolved in a way. Uh, so thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you so much for the great questions. And uh, for those of you asked about the recording, this was being recorded. Um, the recording will be available at www.octogroup.org slash webinars um, within 24 hours. So you can look for it tomorrow. And you'll also receive an email from Zoom, which will send you to that link. Um, so thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. Uh, we're glad to have you on. We're, it's great to learn about this work and, and hopefully uh, there, will, there will be lots of uh, additional work on coastal and marine environments with Vera. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.